We have Dr. Sanjeev Bhadwar, who is the head ENT services at Kokila, the Kokila Ben Dirubai Ambani Hospital. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Bhadwar. Thank you for joining us on ET now and uh, uh, the, coming here to answer all the queries that's there in everyone's minds. And the first one that's there in everyone's mind is the strategy to arrest uh, the spread of the second wave. We're seeing a second wave of COVID-19 situation arising in India, spreading rapidly and fast. Uh, what is the strategy that actually we can adopt to arrest this spread in COVID-19 cases? You see, it is a grim situation. But the picture now and one year ago is entirely different. The entire medical community has been hard at work putting its best foot forward. And if after 30 years, plus years of experience, I might say so. This is one of the finest hours of the medical community where everybody is putting his or her best foot forward. So we have learned on the way, strategies have evolved, and now protocols are in place. The problem with this virus is that things change every day. So one has to be flexible enough and alert enough to move with the changes, and it's an evolving process. But most medical institutions all over the world are prepared to meet this head-on and are better equipped today than we were a year ago when we were taken totally by surprise. Absolutely, Dr. Badwar. It's a, it's a very uh, grim situation and things are actually changing as days go by. You need to be flexible is what you're saying. But is it true that in the new uh, mutation in virus that is happening, even the RT-PCR is not detecting the virus? Uh, it, this is a big uh, doubt that is raising in some of the minds, in some of the cases as well. What's your view on it? Yes, uh, there are two aspects to this. Uh, firstly, I would like to emphasize that RT-PCR for COVID-19 remains the gold standard worldwide. Why has this doubt arisen? There are two factors uh, which explain it. One, in some of the states in India, because of the fear of quarantine, both the patient and the medical practitioners are not doing the RT-PCR. And when the patient is symptomatic and rushed to the hospital, they're just doing a CT scan and based on that, the patient is being treated. So there is a lot of incorrect data floating around because there's a fear in the mind of the patient. Once they test RT-PCR positive, their family would have to go under quarantine. That is one aspect. The second aspect is that this particular virus normally lodges in the area behind the nose what we call technically the nasopharynx. The period which it resides in the nasopharynx this time around is shorter. And after that, it migrates into the lower respiratory tract. So sometimes you may get an RT-PCR negative, one, because the patient has come a little late in the day, the viral shedding in the area behind the nose is low and you may get a negative report. But that doesn't mean anything because as a clinician, you don't treat the patient based on one test alone. We have a whole gamut of investigations. You have to treat the patient as a whole entity. So a history, history of fever in today's day and age, anyone with low grade fever, body ache is COVID positive until proved otherwise. So we recommend that they isolate themselves. The test is repeated again on the sixth or seventh day. And again, the way the test is done is extremely important. It has to be done by a professional who is trained so that the swab reaches the exact area behind the nose and the throat swab is taken too at the same time. So sometimes policies can take place because of the technique too but it remains a good test. And if, despite all this, we still get a negative report, then we look at some blood tests, we look at the clinical profile, we look at the X-ray, and where indicated, a CT scan may be done. But I would again repeat, a CT scan is an adjunct to the diagnosis and should not be overused 
or misused. There is also a view, Dr. Badwar, that people who have got uh, the first shot of the vaccine uh, and have subsequently contracted with COVID are showing better immunity. Is there any data to prove this? You see, all these things are still studied in progress. Once you take the first shot of the vaccine, any vaccine which is available, it takes two to three weeks to promote immunity. So, uh, and basically, after six to eight weeks, a better degree of immunity is created, which is tested by the presence of antibodies against the spike proteins. But it is postulated that after the first shot of the vaccine, two to three weeks down the line, some degree of protective immunity does take place. But it does not prevent the individual from getting a COVID-19 infection. So your question was, you had the vaccine, you had a COVID infection thereafter. So again, post the infection, after one or two months, you have to assess the antibodies and then come to a diagnosis. But all this is still work in progress. Data is still being collated on this to give a definitive answer to your question. Is it true that a few vaccines are not working against the South African mutant virus? Is there any case of this front? Okay. Uh, you know, to answer your question, I'd just like to give a little background. You know, the way viruses are, they keep undergoing mutation. They keep changing their configuration. So, the COVID-19 vaccine has a very large genome, 30 plus. So, it does keep undergoing variations and mutations. To give an example, the common flu vaccine everyone takes every year in the month of April and May. This vaccine changes every year because there is a variation and a mutation. So the vaccine manufacturers and the medical authorities, for us, this is something we have to keep tackling. And it's not a one-off situation that you create a vaccine and there won't be any changes to it. That is part one of the answer. Now, you have a UK variant in play. You have a Brazilian variant in play, the South African variant, and the double Indian variant, which is now going around. Both the vaccines which are available with us have been found to be effective against the UK variant. Now, these vaccines which we have are of two kinds. One is a vaccine which is directed against the spike protein of the COVID-19 virus. So what happens that most mutations occur in the region of the spike protein. So these vaccines may not be that effective against the New York variant. As opposed to the other vaccine which we have, the Covaxin, but still we don't have large studies or data on this. This is based on the inactivated virus. So it is postulated that these vaccines may be more effective, effective, uh, I beg your pardon, against the variants. But we still have, we don't have definitive data on this. But above all this, it is suggested that all these vaccines do afford a certain amount of T cell immunity apart from antibodies. So it is too early to say that the vaccines don't offer any protection. In this age where there is some vaccine hesitancy going around, I would be clear to give advice from this forum that if you can take the vaccine, please go ahead and take it. Some degree of protection is definitely offered. So finally, Dr. Badwar, what would you have to say about the fear that the new mutation of the COVID-19 uh, is actually affecting uh, mostly, uh, rather it's attacking the lungs? Because most of them have this uh, particular concern in the second wave that uh, the new mutation is impacting the lungs. So what, are, what do you have to say on that front? So I would just give you a little clarification on this. Uh, this time around, uh, the presentation of the vaccine has been a little different. One we are seeing more infections in the pediatric age group who were spared in the first wave. Two, the incubation period at times is longer. The infectivity is very high. 
and it spreads very fast. In the first way, we would have one member of a family who tested positive, but now we are having groups of people coming, families coming, old buildings getting affected. So it is highly infectious. It does spread faster. That is one. The clinical symptoms are also changing. Patients are presenting with conjunctivitis, extreme fatigue, vertigo, hearing loss, tinnitus in the, uh, in the ear or ringing sound in the ear, pain abdomen, diarrhea, myalgia, discoloration of the fingers and the toes, and sometimes vascular episodes like gangrene of the leg. So the signs and symptoms are changing. The other question uh, which you asked about going to the lungs, I mentioned at the start of my talk that when the virus comes, it colonizes the upper part of the respiratory tract, that is the region behind the nose. And it lodges here for a shorter time before going down into the lower reaches of the respiratory tract, that is the throat and the lungs. But still, by and large, if you look at uh, the scenario all over India, we have very large numbers and we're still assessing the mortality and the morbidity. But most of the cases do have a milder episode. So it is, it is clear to say that it is still work and study in progress. I would appeal to the public at large that you should not panic. The medical authorities are seized of this. Preparations are underway and it is incumbent on everybody to protect themselves, mask themselves, maintain social distancing, because this is here to stay. And this is what is going to protect you, whether you're vaccinated or not.